The System.Array class, that's the base for all the arrays you'll ever create, provides a large number of interesting and useful methods. All of them are applicable to your own arrays. Not many of these methods, however, are instance methods. That is, you'll very rarely call a method of an array instance. And the ones there are aren't very interesting, like clone. You've seen an example of that. Copy to, we saw an example of that. Get length returns the length of any dimension within an array. There's get lower bound, gets the lower bound of any dimension, and they're pretty much all zero. Get upper bound gets the upper bound of any dimension within your array. Remember we had an array with 50 rows and two columns? You could ask for the get upper bound of the zeroth dimension, that'd be the 50, or the get upper bound of the second dimension, that'd be two. There's the initialize method, which initializes every element of a value type array by calling the default constructor of that value type. This lets you reinitialize an array back to zero for numeric arrays, or false for Boolean arrays. Like I said, not all that interesting. Most of the interesting methods aren't instance methods. They're available for all arrays. You call them as a method of the array class. Also, don't forget to check out the rank and length properties. We've used both of those already. Rank tells you how many dimensions there are, and length gives you the total number of elements in the array. Let's start looking at the interesting methods by starting with sorting. Not all arrays can be sorted. I want to say that first off, and there'll be more on that soon, a lot more. You can usually sort single-dimensioned arrays of simple types. All you have to do is call the array.sort method. Array.reverse is useful if you want to sort in reverse order. First sort it, and then call array.reverse to reverse the sort order. Let's try a simple example that demonstrates this. I'll choose simple sort, E, from the menu. Here we're going to create an array of strings. I'll call it items. And now to display the unsorted list, I'll call the print all method that you've already seen. And it displays the entire list. I'll step over that, and you'll see there's our unsorted list. Here, I'm going to sort the items. I call array.sort passing the array of items, and it does the work. Call print all again, and you'll see here we have a list of people sorted alphabetically. Next, I'll call array.reverse to reverse those items. Since they're sorted alphabetically, this will sort them in reverse alphabetical order, print them out, and now we have our list in reverse alphabetical order. So clearly, sorting a list of strings is easy. Just call the sort method, pass the array you want sorted, and everything works. That would make you think that every array can be sorted, right? Not quite. In order to sort an array, no matter what kind of array, each element of the array has to implement the iComparable interface. That's how the sort method works. It needs some way to compare one item to another. And unless that item implements the iComparable interface, the array can't be sure it can perform the sort. All the built-in simple types implement iComparable, so you can generally sort arrays of simple types. We saw that with the string array. If types don't implement iComparable, attempting to sort an array will generate a runtime exception. Now, if you do implement the iComparable interface, you'll have a compareTo method. And the compareTo method has to compare the existing item to one that's passed in as a parameter. Your method has to return minus 1 if the current object is less than the object you're comparing to, 0 if the two are equal, or plus 1 if your object is greater than the one you're comparing to. Your code is the only one that can make this decision. So in the code, you'll want to compare whatever you want to compare to determine if two items of that type are equal or not. Let's look at an example that shows an invalid sort and a working sort. I'll start with an invalid sort, just to prove the point. Here, I'm going to create an array of four writers. Here we go. I'm stepping over the constructor for each one. And I'm going to attempt to sort this array of writer objects. Why will this fail? This is going to fail because, well, why? Let's see what the message says. 
it says failed to compare two elements in the array. The problem is the writer class doesn't implement iComparable. I'll show you. Here, the writer class doesn't implement iComparable. Sure doesn't. If we go to the writer sortable class, though, this one does implement iComparable. Actually, this one inherits from writer, so I don't have to add any extra stuff. This one inherits from writer and implements iComparable. So all I have to include here is the extra stuff. I have a default constructor, which calls my base.new. It calls the writer class's default constructor. I have a constructor that takes in two parameters, and I call my base.new passing in two constructors. So it calls the base class's constructor, the writer class. Finally, I have a compare to method. When I implement iComparable, I have to have a compare to method. Just to show that to you, let me add a class. That's fine. I'll call it class one. Better give it a reasonable name. We go, and if I come in here and implement iComparable, we get a compare to method. The compare to method says compare this instance of this class to this object and tell the world how they compare. I don't need this, so I'll throw it away. My compare to method says, take the other writer, OBJ, and convert it into a writer sortable. So I take the object, that's how it comes to me, convert it into this type of class, a writer sortable, and then return the value I get by comparing the other writer's name property to my name property. Now, I could have written the code that says if me.name is less than otherwriter.name return minus one, else if me.name equals otherwriter.name return zero, else if me.name is greater than otherwriter.name return plus one, but I don't have to. That's what the compare to method does for a string. Me.name.compare to otherwriter.name returns minus one, zero, or positive one. It does all the work for me. And this explains why we could sort an array of strings, because the string class implements iComparable and therefore provides a compareTo method. We know that. There are those who would pronounce iComparable as iComparable. Tomato, tomato, there's just multiple ways to say it. I call it iComparable. If you want to call it iComparable, as my esteemed co-author might, then more power to you. Okay, so here we have a sortable writer class. Because it implements iComparable, we can perform the sort. Let's try it again now. I'll press F5 to run. We'll try successful sort, G. This time, I won't create an array of writer. I create an array of writer sortable. Step through this thing. Create my four writers. I'm stepping over those constructors so you don't have to walk into the constructor each time. Now I'll call array.sort, and this time it succeeds just fine. Because we've implemented the iComparable interface, we can sort the array of writers. If I print that out now, you'll see we're sorted by first name. That's how we decided to compare those writers, by the name property of each writer. And if the sort method can compare them, it can sort them. What if you need to sort your array on multiple different fields? We sorted on the name field, but you could sort on other things. You might want to sort today by name. Tomorrow, you might want to sort by home state. Implementing iComparable only supports a single sort order. You decide at the time you write that compare to procedure what you want to sort by. What if you need to sort an array containing objects whose source you can't modify? That's another problem. Like if I wanted to sort an array of file info objects, that file info object doesn't implement iComparable, and I can't make it implement iComparable. How am I going to sort them? The answer is you can't. I guess we're done. Well, the answer is really you can. It just requires some extra effort. Let's look at different techniques for solving these two similar problems. To demonstrate sorting an array of file info objects, let's try it. Choose option H, and I'll choose sort files 1. Here, 
I'm going to use the system.io.directory info class given in its constructor a path to look in. I'll call its getFiles method, which returns an array of file info objects, which we'll place into an array of file info objects. OK, that contains objects, and we're ready to sort them. I'll attempt to call, well, I will call, the sort method passing in that array of files. And of course, it's going to fail. It fails because, well, why? It wasn't able to compare elements. File info doesn't implement iComparable. So what do you do? Can you just not sort arrays of files? Well, you can. Here's the technique. Once I fill the array of files, I'm going to call the sort method, but this time passing as a second parameter a new instance of a special class. Compare file names is a class that implements iComparer. The iComparer interface indicates that you must supply a compare method. The compare method receives two objects, x and y. And in this method, you need to cast those variables, x and y, as the correct type of object, file info in this case. Once you have them cast as the correct kind of object, you need to compare them. And I'm going to compare based on the full name property of the file. File1.fullName.compare2, file2.fullName, I'll compare those and return my minus 1, 0, or plus 1 as the return value of this method. Well, that's one way to compare files. I can also compare them based on lengths. Here's the compare file lengths class, and this also implements iComparer. The compare method receives two objects. I cast them as the correct kind of object. Now here, I'm going to compare the lengths of the two files, file1.length compared to file2.length, and take that result and store it away in a variable. If that result is zero, it means the two files had the exact same length. And if two files have the same length, I want to compare their full name properties and sort by full name instead. So here, if the result is zero, I'll compare full name of one to the full name of the other and return that result, which allows me to sort first by size and then by name. So if we continue running, in our output, you'll see a list of files here sorted alphabetically by name, and here a list of files sorted numerically by size. If files have the same size, they appear alphabetically by name. That's how our comparison worked. If you look at the code again for this, let's run it once again. If you look at the code for this, in option I, you'll see that we pass a new instance of that iComparer class to perform the comparison for us. Using this technique, you can sort any array. The element in the array doesn't have to implement iComparable, and you can use the same technique to sort any array on a number of different sort orders, even if the item in the array does implement iComparable. Why use two separate classes to provide two different sort orders? Couldn't we do it in one? You can create one class that determines the sort order based on information that you supply. It compares the array values according to your choice of sort order. This isn't a feature of the framework. This is just a technique you can use to make it easier to create your iComparer class. Let's take a look. Let's look at option J, sort files 3 here. And I'll walk into this procedure and see how this works. Again, I'll fill an array with a list of files. And here, I'm going to use a class named compareFiles. CompareFiles looks like it requires me to pass to its constructor a parameter indicating how I want to sort. Let's go look. CompareFiles here still implements iComparer, but it has a public enum named compare field, which tells us which field we want to compare on, name or length. And enum provides a numeric value. This has a value 0, this has value 1, but it doesn't matter. It's just a named value that I can use to indicate which field I want to sort on. We have a variable named compare on, which is of that enumeration type, compare field, 
and the default for this is compareField.name. So I'm assuming if you don't tell me otherwise that you want to sort based on name. Well, of course, the only constructor I supply here requires you to pass to me what field you want to sort on. So you pass in name or length as compare field, and I store that into this variable. When it comes time to compare, what does this do? Uh, same old thing, gets two objects, converts them into file infos. If you've selected to sort based on name, I do a comparison based on the name. If you've decided to compare based on the length, I do the lines of code you saw already. That is, compare the lengths, if they're the same, compare on full name and return the result back. The only wrinkle to this is you're specifying when you create the instance of this comparer which field you want to sort on. So you're only maintaining one class, not two. If we go back to our code then, here we are in the constructor for this class. We've told it what to sort on. We do the sort and we display the info. We just sort on file names. Yes, we did. Now we do the same thing. Create a new instance of the compare files class, telling it you want to sort on length. I'll step over that. We've sorted it. We can now display those items sorted by length. The result is the same as the last example, except this time you only had to use one class, not two. So if you wanted to be able to sort on multiple different fields, you could extend this to select any one of those fields. And then when you create the instance of the comparer, indicate to the comparer what you want to sort on. It seems like there should be some way to make this easier. The iComparable and iComparer interfaces pass object types to their procedures. You have to end up converting those yourself. Would be a lot easier if they passed strongly typed values. Well, they can't. Now, you really don't even need iComparer if you don't want to use it. Generics and delegates, those two features, make it possible to supply a procedure rather than a class instance to perform the comparisons. I'll show a demonstration of this here. The procedure must accept two parameters of the same type matching the type that's stored in the array. The procedure has to return an integer value, and it has to be those magic numbers. Minus 1 if the first object is less than the second object, 0 if they're equal, and plus 1 if the first object is greater than the second object. Now this really does use generics and delegates, two features we haven't discussed yet, to allow the code to compile. But you don't have to understand either of those features to get this feature to work. All you have to remember are the rules. The procedure has to accept two parameters of the same type, and it has to return an integer value, and the values have to be the correct type, same as in the array, and the return value has to be minus one, zero, or plus one, but in any case, if you follow the rules, you can make this work. Let's give it a try. I'll choose option L, sort writers, to demonstrate this behavior. Before we go farther, note up here that I have two functions, compare writer name and compare writer home. Each of these accepts as parameters two items of the same type that are stored in the array and return integers, writer, writer, integer. And in both cases, we just compare values and return them. Here we compare the name properties of the two writers. Here we compare the home state properties of the two writers. And they return negative one, zero, or positive one, as required by any comparer. Here I'll fill in the four items in the array. And I'm going to call the array.sort method, passing my writer's array to be sorted, and not a new instance of a class, but this time the address of a procedure. The address of keyword allows me to pass a procedure as a parameter. Compare writer name is a procedure I'd like to have the sort method call in order to perform its comparisons. And in order to do that, I have to use the address of keyword to indicate that what follows is the address of a procedure. So here, I use that procedure to perform the comparisons between writers. And I'll display all those writers. I'll repeat the operation by using the compare writer home method to compare two writers' home state properties. We'll sort this time using that comparer instead. Print them all out, 
and you'll see that the first list is sorted alphabetically by name, and the second list is sorted alphabetically by state. The differences are subtle, I know, but you can tell by looking how they're sorted. In any case, this is a much simpler technique for sorting on multiple fields than creating and maintaining your own separate class. Passing the address of a comparer procedure seems a lot easier to me. You need to think about what your sorting options are. If you're creating an array of your own class and you want one default sort order for the most part, just make sure your class implements iComparable and provide the sorting information right there. This allows you to create a default sort order so you can just say array.sort and it'll sort. If you're sorting an array of objects and you can't force the object to implement iComparable, you need to create a class that implements iComparer to perform the comparison, or create a procedure that meets the requirements for comparing two of the same type, like we just saw. If you need to sort in multiple orders, either create one class that implements iComparer that allows you to specify the sort order, or create multiple procedures to perform those comparisons. There's a lots of if-then-elses in this slide here, but you just need to think about what your goal is and how much control you have over the classes you're trying to sort. Well, we've learned how to sort. How about finding things in arrays? There are a couple different ways to do it. You can use array.indexof or array.lastindexof for linear searches through single-dimensioned arrays. Each item returns the index of the first match it finds. Index of starts at the beginning, looks at every item until it finds a match, and then returns the index of what it found. Array.last index of starts at the end, works backwards until it finds the last matching index of the thing you're trying to match. You can use the array.binary search method to search through a sorted single dimensioned array. Sorted is the operative word here. The array has to be sorted first. This is significantly more efficient than index of or last index of because it doesn't perform a linear search. Instead, it does a binary search, which if you've ever studied data structures, you know what that is. It's the concept of splitting the data in half over and over until it finally focuses in on the data you want. Like looking for a name in the phone book. You don't, in a phone book, start at the beginning and search through till you find the name you want. You figure it's in the first half of the book and then your brain sort of collapses it down till exactly where you want to find it. Here, the binary search works that way. For a thousand items, index of would on average have to loop through 500 of those thousand items to find the item it wants. On average, it'll look through half the items. Binary search, on the other hand, for a thousand items will on average look at about 10 items. The speed is on the order of log base 2 of the number of items in the array you're searching. It's a lot faster. This returns the index of the matching position. Or, this is tricky, the two's complement of the position where the item would appear if it was in the array. Two's complement well, that's dealing with stuff we generally don't deal with in a course like this, but to convert the two's complement back to the real index of where it would be, take the negative, subtract one. We have an example of that coming up in just a bit. Of course, index of and binary search only work on simple arrays. What if you have an array of file info objects? What if you want to find a file with a particular name? Or if you want to retrieve a subarray that contains all the files that match a particular set of criteria. The array class provides techniques for searching that use delegates and generics. And although we won't delve deeply into those, these are still useful, and we'll show an example of them. So, what if you want to find all the files in an array of file info objects that are smaller than a specific size? You could walk the array manually, adding the files that match the criteria to a new array. Better yet, we can use the find all method. This is one of these methods that uses techniques a little beyond the scope of this chapter, but we can still demonstrate how it works. You pass in the array to be searched. Also, pass in the address of a procedure to be called for each entry in the array. The procedure has to return true for acceptable files and false for rejects. It's a really simple procedure. It's a simple concept. 
the find all method uses this procedure whose address you pass to accept or reject each element in the array. Let's try examples of these features. Let's start by testing the index of method. I'll choose option M. Here's our array, a single dimension array of strings. In this case, a bunch of states. I'm going to look for the string Texas. How do we do it? We call the array.indexOf method. You pass in the array to look in and the state to find. It either succeeds or not. If index is minus one, that means it wasn't found. Otherwise, we get the index where it was found. Okay, let's try one that isn't found. Let me enter a state to find like, uh, not Texas, but Texas. There we go. We'll come into our code. We'll loop back around. We'll attempt to find that. And of course, Texas wasn't found. And so we see the index is minus one. And we'll display that now. Okay, well that proved that it works both when a state is found and when it isn't found. Okay, how about the binary search method? Oh, by the way, the last index of method works just the same, except it starts at the end and looks backwards for the last index. In this case, since there are no duplicates, we would have gotten the same responses. Let's try binary search. Now remember, this requires a sorted array. Now these are sorted, but you generally have to call the sort method before you can use binary search. I would never call binary search unless I'd already sorted the data manually. And actually when you think about it, let's go look up here a second, I just realized it's not sorted because Washington DC is way up here. I guess these things are sorted by abbreviation or something and that doesn't help us much here. So we're gonna have to sort the array of states. So what do we do? I'm gonna call the binary search method passing in the array to look in and the state to find. If the index is less than zero, that indicates that the index wasn't found. And if the index isn't found to determine where it would be in the list if it was there, we take the index, multiply by minus one, and subtract one. That lets us convert from the value they return to the index where the item would have appeared, pushing everything else out of the way. In this case, Texas does appear, and we find it at position, well, 45 still. Let's try it again now with a value that isn't in the list. Let me try something that would appear before the first state. So AAA wasn't found, but it would have appeared before the current item zero in the list. So we'd have to push item zero out of the way to make room for AAA. Let's try something like ZZZ, search for it, and it wasn't found, but it would have appeared before item 54, which is the last item in our list. So this way we can tell where the item would be in the list if it was in the list. Now you can't tell that this is happening very quickly. It's, how can you possibly tell? But binary search does execute much more rapidly than other methods of searching through an array. Lastly, let's look at this find all method. It's just one of a class of methods that allow you to use an address of a procedure to do some work in the array. And to be honest, when we get to the chapter on generic collection classes, we'll spend a lot of time looking at those methods. Here we go. I'm going to fill my array full of file info objects. And now I would like to create an array which consists of all the files that are small. Well, where is this check for small file procedure? Let's go find it. The check for small file procedure has to accept one parameter, which is the same type as the data in the array, file info. The code won't compile if you don't follow these rules. Has to return a Boolean, and inside the procedure, you determine whether to say yay or nay on the file passed in. So if the file's length is less than 1,000, we say yes, accept the file. If the file's length is greater than 1,000, we won't accept it. So let's move on from here. Here, in our procedure, we're going to call find all, passing the array of files, and the address of the procedure that we use to determine whether to accept a file or not. The find all method returns an array of file info containing just the accepted results. 
then I can display that output array on the console window. Let's try it. Here you can see the original files, including those that were small and those that were big. Here is the list of output files, including only the ones that were less than 1,000 bytes. We got a new array. We didn't have to loop through all the elements ourselves. We just said, OK, .NET, hand me the array. You do all the work. I'll give you the address of a procedure you can use to determine which files are acceptable, but that's all it takes. Nothing could be easier than that. When I first discovered these methods, I got so excited because this is so much easier than any alternative means of finding a subset of an array.